hello everyone and welcome back to flo's corner so in this video we are going to be doing another phlebotomy q a part two so here i have all of the questions that i am going to touch up on like i said you guys did not disappoint y'all was asking questions and i tried to let y'all know then I'm gonna get right to it as soon as I could. And here we go, y'all. So question one reads, how do you know which tubes to spin? Okay, when I worked in the hospital, I did not spin any tubes. We were just phlebotomists, we just drew, and then we sent the specimens down the chute or we sent, we walked down there ourselves and handed them over to the lab. So normally, they kept the phlebotomist and the lab technicians separate. So when I was a phlebotomist in the hospital, we didn't touch on anything besides drawing the patient and the color of the tubes that it was supposed to be. We didn't do any spinning. But now that I work in a clinic, and I've had worked and I'm working in the laboratory as well, we do spin our tubes pretty much whenever we do our orders and they're like the requisitions come in of the patients and stuff and it'll tell us which ones we have to draw like a quantiferon or we have to draw rpr or anything like that whenever we type those in normally when our requisition uh, prints out it tells us what the tubes are so i'm going to insert it here for the company that i work for now like here you will see it says serum separator tube and it'll also say rpr which is what the um test that is going to be because i am going to draw for an rpr that's going to be tested so the serum separator tube just means that it's going to be an sst which means that most sst's are the ones that are going to get spun normally so like i said if i was working in a hospital i would draw an sst and then we would send it to the lab and they spin it but because of where i work I will draw the patient and then I will let it clot and then I will centrifuge it and then, well, which means spin it and then there you go. So normally on our little requisitions, you can see which tubes you are going to draw, not the color coordinated one because for the company that I work for now, our requisitions let us know what um additive tube it is like when it tells us certain testing and this is why you have the knowledge of a phlebotomist which is knowing when you're about to draw for tsh or if you're about to draw for t3 or vitamin b you as a phlebotomist should know which tubes those go those go in but um every company is different like i said when i work for the hospital when we uh clicked on the patient's um like where the patient was on our little mobi phones it'll tell us what we needed to draw and it told us actually the color of the tubes so the company i work for now it does not tell you the color of the tubes it tells you like, what the types of tubes you're going to use like whenever i'm drawing a lavender it would say edta it won't tell you lavender edta so like i said it depends on the company that you work for depending on how you would know which uh, tubes to spend. But also with my company, we have a thing on our website. So the website pretty much, if you get your orders from of patients and their doctors and things, it will have what type of testing the doctor is looking for. So on our website, you normally can just play, put the digits of the testing and it'll tell you 2ML serum, which you'll know would be SST, or it'll say 4ML EDTA and you just, kind of sort of will know that that's going to be a lavender so the thing about phlebotomy is that you need to learn these things with the tube so you know that what testing is which so you do not have that mixture of putting the blood in the wrong tubes or you can always just find a phlebotomy book and if you see that you have to draw a vitamin b or uh, like i said a t a t3 or t4 you can find these things in like books and things like that and it'll tell you what color tube normally to put these specimens in. and they will also tell you like if you needed to spin them or however or like i said if you're any type of unsure ask for help you always going to have a supervisor you can ask the supervisor um this says um a frozen a critical frozen i'm not sure if i have to spin this or however 
ask questions and you'll find out what tubes you have to spend so you're not confused. So definitely have knowledge of the type of testing that you will need to do in your phlebotomy career because like i said sometimes you just don't get a job where they will tell you the actual tubes they'll tell you the type of test that needs to be um done which will in turn you should know or like i said you can look up to see which tube that specimen is going to go in and the more you do it the more it becomes repetitive and that's from anywhere that you go if you know that you're going to move from jobs or going from a hospital to a clinic a lot of the times the tubes are pretty much the same um the only thing i noticed that's a little bit different is that sometimes the ssts um tend to be like a different color different places like they're tiger tops at over here at a clinic and then they may be a red or something like that so you just you know ask questions like i said you know if you see a tube that just looks unfamiliar to you just ask questions like what is this oh that's an sst tube okay so you know that all your sst draws you're going to place into that tube okay question two asks what is training like when you get a job okay so you guys know that i came from school and i got my first phlebotomist job as in the hospital so pretty much training was i think i trained for at least two weeks normally and pretty much you are following a phlebotomist you are shadowing another phlebotomist and um it's normally up to your trainer they'll show you like the little procedures like they'll tell you to bring what to bring into the room um what do you do like scan the patient's wristband and um you know obviously show you where everything is you're going to know where all the inventory is and you know stuff like that what you're going to need for on your mobile cart and however you know they'll also give you if you've never been in the, working in the hospital they're going to show you all the floors where to go you know but most of the time you'll see a couple of drawers probably from your um phlebotomist that you're um that you're shadowing and then they'll tell you okay well are you ready to draw you know now let me see you go ahead and you know do what i just taught you so pretty much the same thing that's pretty much how training is it's nothing really um hardcore you may feel a little bit nervous because you're like oh my god i never you know drew like that besides training or besides school that i had prior so pretty much whenever you get a job you're just learning whatever is going on at your facility so if you're at a hospital or if you're at a clinic you're just learning their ways that's pretty much it but phlebotomy stays the same all the way around it's just a little bit of the techniques is a little bit different like you'll check in this way when you're working at a hospital but then checking in is different and in a clinic so you're pretty much that's really what training is really about it's nothing too tedious you'll probably have to do some sit down um computer work for certain jobs and things like that but no pretty much phlebotomy is pretty much the same all the way around it's you know tie the tourniquet you know fill the vein you know wipe wipe with the alcohol swab all of that is pretty much the same same procedure all the way around 360 no matter where you're working but it's just you're just learning the protocols and things of where you are working okay so question number three says how do you know what tubes to draw for each patient each patient does it tell you or is it something you have to know okay i didn't even notice that that's kind of similar to how i answered question number one which is pretty much um like i said depending on your job whether it actually tells you before you enter into into, into a patient's room or if you're working at a clinic and you have the requisition and it says you're going to need two blue tops or one lavender or whatever um it depends on where you're working where you're working but it is good to have knowledge of what testing goes and what tubes because you may work at jobs where you're not going to actually see it say the color of the tube but it's going to tell you what kind of test is going to be tested so as a phlebotomist you should know what um certain tests um the color of the tubes are and like i said there is too much books and online things that you can find that will tell you this type of test is going to be in this color tube you can find out so quickly normally wherever you work should have a directory a test directory where you can place in the order number of the testing and it'll tell you um it's a serum it's an edta you know things like that so like i said it's it's one of those things it depends on where you work at um i don't want to say you should not know what certain tests are but like i said when you work somewhere kind of get to know what you're going to be drawing a lot the hospital would be like the only place where you're kind of like you'll get all types of testing you know not every patient is going to have the same 
type of blood work drawn. So those like that, you're probably going to get more familiar with what tubes and what testing go for these certain tubes and stuff. But if you work at a clinic, you might work at a clinic where you're always um, uh, drawing the same type of testing because of a certain doctor you work for or however but most of the time it is i do recommend that you do learn all of the testing that goes with certain um tubes because like i said it's one of those things where it's universal anywhere you go you may not need to know um i mean don't get caught up on knowing what color tubes go for certain uh testing because like i said you may work somewhere where it's not going to be the same and you don't want to be stuck and not knowing what to do so always i would say learn the testing and learn the tube colors in that order and like i said there is just so much um knowledgeable things out there online books things you can have on your phone and stuff that can tell you if i'm doing a vitamin d or i mean excuse me <laughs> vitamin d it could be anything it could be you know um a, a cmp um uh a lipid panel you know and stuff like that you kind of would should know which types of color tubes those are but like i said if you put something simple it's like that in google it'll tell you exactly what tube it goes in so that was just beckoning on question part one i mean question number one <laughs> okay question number four if there's not another phlebotomist around during a heart stick in that moment what would you suggest okay so this has happened i've had worked in a laboratory by myself and yeah you get a heart stick and there's no one there you don't have an extra set of eyes you don't have an extra set of hands and you're like okay what now okay so you know as a phlebotomist you're gonna get heart sticks it's gonna happen most of the time if you cannot and i mean you're not going to sit there and try to be with a patient for over an hour because you know you have other patients to draw you have other things to do if you are there i would say maybe more than 10 minutes and you tried all kinds of things with the tourniquet turning the patient however if you cannot achieve any type of blood draw successfully then this patient honestly will have to be a redraw you will have to have that patient come back or you would have to um call your supervisor let them know i've tried everything i've tried everything in the hands the forearm the anterior elbow and i just can't get anything or however and normally your supervisor will tell you what to do um maybe they can come back on a day that you're not there and maybe someone else can try or maybe you can have them scheduled another time when you'll have like maybe your supervisor can come and help you for that day for that patient you know when that patient is gonna be rescheduled to come back the next day or two days later or however to have another you know set of hands that might actually be successful in doing this blood draw but um that's the only thing that i can say because there's nothing else that you can do if you can't get this draw you can't get it it's just no other way i mean we can't snap our fingers and go give me the blood it's just not gonna work and like i said you don't have that much time to focus on this patient when there are other patients coming through that door or however so normally the person would probably be a redraw or your supervisor may say to send them to another lab it's part of our company but it'll probably be like send them to another lab and then also obviously you definitely will uh send um information or call back to wherever the patient came from normally like whatever clinic they came from or a hospital or everything like that and you will definitely let them know that this patient was a heart sick i was not able to draw this patient and i called my supervisor and this is what's going to happen normally like i said a redraw they're going to be sent to another laboratory or however so question five reads what are the hazards for a phlebotomist like risk well, number one definitely is an accidental needle stick. That just means that you actually punctured yourself with the needle. Now, that can be very dangerous. Honestly, everyone knows that because you don't want to stick yourself by accident before you even got to the patient or you don't want to definitely stick yourself with the same needle that you stuck a patient with because we don't know 
what everyone has and there's so many other pathogens and parasites and all kinds of things that come from blood so that's also part two which is bloodborne pathogens that can get into your system and that's not great as a phlebotomist just knowing that um i've stuck hiv patients i've stuck patients that have things that can be contracted through the blood and the last thing you want is an accidental needle stick especially after you draw a patient because who just wants to get stuck by a needle that doesn't need to be stuck by a needle i'm just saying but those are the main um i would say hazards and risks as a phlebotomist because there's so many bloodborne pathogens out there this is also why it's good to practice safe injection practices like you know the sharps protection devices like you definitely always want to have immediate disposal disposable of your needles or any sharp objects like as soon as you um remove the the needle from the patient's arm put the safety hazard on and then you you know you immediately put it in the sharps container that's one of them that can prevent needle stick injuries question six reads how to prevent needle stick injuries um honestly you just need the cooperation of the patient pretty much you know talking them through it making sure that no one moves or anything like that make sure your area is a well lit area that you can see what you're doing um, make sure it's clean that there's nothing around to get in the way so that you don't you know jerk a certain way and accidentally poke yourself with the needle there's a bunch of different um preventive pre preventative things that you can do to not um get stuck yourself by a needle Question seven reads, what are the main gauges used for blood draws? Uh, 21 gauge is normally the standard universal um, gauge uh, size of the needle that you would normally use. Those are really for people who have good and stable veins normally. Um, 23 gauges are used normally for people who have very small and fragile veins like newborns or young children. Certain circumstances, you may have to use them on geriatrics or you may have to use them on any adult who just, you feel like a 21 gauge is too big and you may not get this vein or they have veins that are just not cooperating, then you can use a 23 gauge. Uh, normally, sometimes, most of the time, if I have a regular adult and they have small veins in the hand when i'm getting ready to do a hand stick i will use a 23 gauge depending on the circumstance and i have used a 25 gauge it is not really feasible to use a 25 gauge because anything smaller than a 23 gauge needle normally ends up in hemolyzing the specimen and that is not what we want because then it's not good for the specimen to be tested on which means that the patient has to be redrawn or anything like that but 25 gauges i have used on a newborn or i have used on a very small child a very small child like i would say toddler stage maybe sometimes you might use a 25 gauge but those are like once in a blue it's not something that i naturally use all the time but that is very much smaller than a 23 gauge and that's normally for like really 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 tiny veins but you definitely have to use your phlebotomy procedures when doing a using a 25 gauge because you don't want the specimen to be rejected because of excessive hemolysis so Question eight reads, advice for left-handed phlebotomists. I've been dying to get to this question because I am a right-handed phlebotomist and I do know lefties. I know left-handed people. I have a lot of friends. I have people I work with that are left-handed and I know that it's hard for you guys a whole lot because you do live in a right-handed world where there's a lot of things that's not really catered to lefties. And I feel for y'all. I do. I really feel for y'all. I love to see y'all do y'all thing because I just love to see that it's so different from the norm. So shout out to my lefties. Hey. <laughs> but going off of people that I know, especially on the phlebotomist um, spectrum. So pretty much a lot of the phlebotomists that I know are left-handed they pretty much just learn the right-handed procedures and they just adjust accordingly so i've known a lot of lefties that tend to 
know how to draw with their right hand or they just can still draw with their left hand as the strong dominant hand and they just have to change up just certain things um some of them that i have seen and i've spoken to they pretty much have the patient um help so you can have the patient like hold you know the little kidney bean little um <laughs> little uh how do you call it is it a cup or a tray i really honestly don't know but it looks like a kidney bean if you worked in the hospital or, or worked in the medical field you'll know what that mean by that but pretty much you put like your tourniquet and your tubes and everything like that you bring that into the patient's room normally or if you work at a clinic it's normally there for you to have by your side so you have everything in this one little dish so that you can uh get ready to um draw your patient successfully so i know for the lefties they'll have like the patient um help out which is like i've seen them say um can you give me the purple tube could you give me the yellow one they'll say that for the patient to you know because the patient's arm is pretty much there so the other one is kind of free so while they're kind of like um you know once they get the draw and everything like that because of the right-handed um desk and things like that it may not be feasible for the left-handed person because their hands will kind of get just get in each other's way so they'll also ask the patient to help out which i've seen is not a bad thing most of the time patients don't have any problem with helping you out i'm a right-handed phlebotomist and i've asked patients could you pass me that one could you pass me this gauze um i've even seen some tell them to take the tourniquet off themselves and you know pretty much like i said you just whoop, and it comes off i um, haven't seen them actually really complain too much that it's so hard to be a left-handed phlebotomist like i said it's one of those things some of them already kind of just adjusted according to the world anyways growing up because they know everything in school and things like that the world just doesn't always cater so much to the left hander so i know that the lefties that i know they just adjusted to how the world kind of is i mean they still obviously do everything with the dominant hand which is going to be your left and things but most of the time with jobs and things like that, if they know that it caters in this particular way, a lot of them knew how to change it up pretty much. I don't think it's impossible for anyone to be in the medical field and be a left-handed person in such a right-handed world where everything is just according to the right-handedness. I don't think it's impossible for you not to be successful at anything you do. You know, you just have to wear humans and we literally, we adjust. So definitely shout out to my lefties. Let me give y'all some inspiration. Don't give up. Y'all can still be for bottomish just as much. I'm going to insert some footage of what my like table and stuff looks like in my um, clinic. So you can see here that it is made for the person to put their right hand here which may make it a little bit difficult for a left-handed person to draw this patient but also over here on the left side you can uh, draw the patient on their left hand as well you can just pretty much like make it comfortable for your way and also here you see i have this little um cart which has all of my stuff in i've shown this cart in many of my other phlebotomy videos which just shows all the um utensils and all of my instruments that i'm going to be using to successfully draw my patients and here you can move this i feel that if you needed to move your station just a little bit over so it's not like like see right here on this wall then you can place it there and maybe that might be more beneficial to you as a lefty like i said you kind of work with what you got i've seen lefties they take um they've had chairs near them like those little rolly chairs it almost looks like a stool but it has the um the wheels at the bottom they roll that over if they need that for their little kidney thing or their little tray to sit on there while they are able to draw the patient then that works as well like i said you make it work for how you want it and also talk to your supervisor be real because sometimes they if they need this site covered and this site needs a phlebotomist or however like that i'm talking on the clinical world you have to do what's best for you if this is going to be where you're going to work tell them hey i need a little stool or i need a little chair or something like that with wheels so you can adjust accordingly and i don't think they'll ever really honestly give you a problem because they want that phlebotomist to be there to successfully draw these patients then they'll make it very <laughs> suitable for you so do not be afraid to speak up
Question nine reads, can a phlebotomist also be a lab technician? Of course, y'all, you can definitely do that. I noticed that you can do that, especially when I worked in the hospital. They literally cross-trained you. So you could work as a phlebotomist. And then, um, like, I think when you worked a couple of months there, like, probably like your 90 day probation, sometimes they'll start training you down there in the lab. So I've seen um, the lab technicians, like whenever we were short staffed, they would go upstairs, they would start drawing and stuff like that. Or if there's a stat and there's no phlebotomist that can kind of get away to do a draw and they need this draw because a ner the nurses or the doctors are calling them down in the lab, hey, I need a phlebotomist up here because I need a stat because we're about to do a surgery, however, most of the time, the lab technicians might come up there. I mean, to be real with you, they'll tell you as a phlebotomist on the floor. But if you're like, oh, I have a lot, I'm stuck with a heart stick or however like that, then it's no problem for them to just get up from being downstairs and t doing all the testing and things like that and go upstairs and draw themselves. I've seen it. They'll go to a pediatrics floor or they'll go upstairs to the one of the... ICUs or anything like that draw the patient and then boom they'll come back downstairs spin it or whatever they need to do and there you go so in the hospital I noticed that they do cross train you um I guess depending on if they feel that you're you know you hit you've hit that threshold where you're doing you know so well and it's never hurts to ask it never hurts to ask hey um I would love to know like how to do the testing and and spinning and you know doing all the things that you do downstairs which is awesome so yes you can become a lab technician and certain jobs they have them where it's actually doing both you're the phlebotomist and you can be the lab technician so that's great question 10 reads what should i do if i don't feel comfortable drawing newborns or pediatric patients okay well i understand um dealing with children can be a little bit time consuming and you have to have a lot of patience because it's very hard to calm children um newborns obviously they move a lot um it can be a scary scary situation for you if you don't feel confident in yourself but honestly i feel that don't do it if you haven't had any type of training dealing with pediatric patients because you don't want to make a mistake um make sure that wherever you are getting your training if they know if you feel that they will place you with children or newborns make sure that you are very well trained and that's pretty much telling them to you know let you shadow take you with the where the children's are i mean excuse me where the children are where the, where the pediatric floor is and have them perform the blood draws or however like that and when you are doing your first one just make sure that you feel confident in yourself um talk through it with the person that's shadowing you and and you know tell them to talk you through it let me know what i'm doing and things like that um situations with children it's not really hard the only thing i can say is that i'm a mother so i know you know how children can be i guess i have more of a calming type of demeanor when it comes to children and you don't I'm just saying you don't have to be a mother to or a parent to have any of that you know some people are just very good with children but um you do have to have a lot of patience it is one of those things you might not just walk into a pediatrics room or a newborn's room and be in there for only less than three minutes because you know this patient is definitely not that calm <laughs> needles for kids is very hard they don't know how to deal with it and they're scared and things like that so just definitely go in there with a very calming attitude um like i said pretty much the blood draw is pretty much the same obviously newborns know you're really not going to really draw too much of a newborn in the anterior elbow um pocket so most of the time it's more like heel sticks for newborns and stuff but you you'll be trained to do that if they ever going to try to place you somewhere there don't ever feel that maybe somebody new came on board and they go hey you go downstairs to pediatrics and go to or go to labor and delivery and grab this um pku from a baby and you're like um i've never drawn a baby before you know so tell someone don't let them just kind of throw you there and you don't know what you're doing you know like i said before always stand up for yourself at all times um uh, it's up to you. It's up to you as a person. Uh, becoming a phlebotomist, you're going to know that you're going to draw everybody. It's because that's one thing that you also learn in school. You're not just learning just the adult and the geriatrics and people who are 20 plus years or however. They're going to teach you everything about where to stick a baby, where to stick 
toddlers, um, school-age children, young teens, adolescents, you should be well knowledge knowledgeable in those areas because that's what the phlebotomy training normally does for you it doesn't just supposedly teach you about adults and geriatrics but like i said if you know if you don't feel confident in yourself and it is something that you haven't done then i will definitely say make sure if they do have you drawing from a pediatric patient or a newborn make sure that you have someone else who's a little bit more experienced so that you don't feel like you're going to make a mistake never just kind of just jump on and just be like yeah i got this and you're down there by yourself and you're afraid and you're scared you're not sure what you're doing is correct or anything like that always ask for help like i always say always ask for help and things and then it'll just become like routine for you where where you know you'll get pediatric patients and it's like boom bam boom i know what i'm doing Eh, nothing no big deal you know children will be children they love to be talked to they like to be reassured and things like that. And honestly, you have to do that for your adult patients as well and geriatrics. A lot of people are not feasible. I mean, excuse me, feasible. <laughs> A lot of people are not just very energetic when it comes to getting their blood drawn so you do you have to do the same thing you have to be very empathetic you have to communicate you have to calm the patient down and things of that nature so it's not a pediatric thing a lot of people think oh only pediatrics do that no honey we have adults <laughs> that do it as well you know so you know just just make sure that all of your phlebotomy training is all there be an empathetic person communicate so that the patient can be cooperative and however and you can make it a great experience for you and you can make it a great experience for them so yeah but that is all for this video i really honestly hope that i answered all of y'all questions like i said if you still got more questions just keep emailing it to me dm me put it down in the comments anything i am here for y'all i'm here to answer y'all questions like i said before i am not a professional but this is all of my personal experience and things that i have been going through in my phlebotomy journey and i just want to be here to help anyone try to give you more of a realistic type approach versus you know reading from a book of how things are so i hope this is very helpful for anyone who is in their phlebotomy journey thinking about starting or however like i said you got this so welcome to the phlebotomy life all right but i thank you all for tuning in and i'll see you all in my next video bye